This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geek show number 523, recorded on February 10th, 2022. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the average guy.tv studios in the fake spring. Mike, this is that trickery that's coming on, right? It's kind of kind of faking us out. Well, and why does it why is it during the week but not on the weekends? Like I need to clean out my garage desperately. It is driving both hand and I nuts. And it's it's been fifties all week. It's gonna be twenty five on Saturday. Yeah, and I'm like, come on. Year, right? It's, it's that <laughs> time of year. Gavin, you're you're up north uh, a little bit. Are you guys still in the dead of winter or is it is are you getting some fake spring like we're getting right now? I think we're getting some fake spring right now. We got hit a couple weeks back with a lot of snow. So um the pot we, we ran out of places to put the snow. Yeah. Um but it's starting <laughs> to melt. It was like three degrees Celsius. Yeah. Um. Today, so it's starting to melt, but then it's supposed to go down to minus twenty Celsius next week. So it's up and down. Well, it's that time of year. Don't get tricked if you're in the northern hemisphere. Uh, don't get tricked. This is not really the. Sp- this is not the droids that you're looking for. <laughs> we will see some more winter, uh, before things are done. Uh, and what we what you probably won't see. You want to go out and see some show notes. There won't be a lot of them, but out at the average guy dot TV. Couple reminders uh, before we move on. One. We'll be back to the premiere on Saturday. So if you want to come out and watch this in its premiere status on YouTube, go to the average guy.tv slash YouTube. Uh, uh, follow, subscribe. That's the right word. Subscribe there on YouTube. Uh, but just join us at noon central and we get together and there's some folks in chat. It's just a fun way. If you can't join us on Thursdays, it's a great way to do it. Saturday uh, noon central on YouTube. Mike and I will do a live Discord show again on the 24th of February. Mike, is that going to work for you? Are you going to be around? I should, Pretty I sure. Should yeah, sure. I leave okay. the next morning. Okay. Um, so, yes. I'm here Good. So, February 24th, 2022. If it's after that, you missed it. But uh, we'd love to have you come out and join us live and then stay around for a Discord show. Just gives everybody a chance to kind of chat in that way. Big thanks to our Patreon supporters and subscribers as well for all that you do uh, for us and appreciate it. Gavin Campbell is with us again. Gavin, you, you started um, working with the home tech FM guys. Is that uh, you yes. some podcasting with the guys? Tell me a little bit. Uh, well, one, welcome back. And then tell me a little bit Thank about you. that. Oh, no, it's great to be back. But um, yeah, at the end of the year, uh, Seth over at HomeTech.fm was a podcast I listened to religiously. Mm-hmm. Um, he he kind of was doing it by himself for a little while, and he was reaching out for some assistance. So TJ and myself both reached out to him and said, hey, ooh, this is what we have to offer. We're interested in getting into the podcast. Um, and he accepted. And now the three of us do it. TJ, um, he's a pro installer. So he comes from that side of things. I'm a do-it-yourselfer, or, you know, um, so I represent that. And Seth's kind of in between both. So the three of us together give us, uh, you know, different angles to all the stories and stuff. Yeah, it's funny. This show originally, you know, 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, was Home Tech. That's what I called it. And then it would change the name. Uh, I was doing some work with Dave McCabe, and um, he had he formed the Geeks Network. And so I thought, well, maybe this is an opportunity to change the name of the show. And that's when we changed it to Home Gadget Geeks. Uh, that we stayed the geeks network uh, didn't and uh and but the but the name stayed around and then i think I, do you know how long they've been doing home tech um dot fm it's been a while it's one of those podcasts i've been listening to for been years six seven you know? so, yeah. yeah it wasn't long after that i think they picked it up and and uh and so good good on them good podcast so if you're you're looking for something else to listen to and you want to hear hear more of gavin you can head over to hometech.fm and are you on that is that weekly are you on every week how are you guys doing that it's weekly all three of us we get together every week uh we record usually on wednesdays and then it doesn't get posted till uh i think friday because Seth's a little lazy sometimes (laughs) why i'm too (laughs) listen i i did the the youtube premiere just surely to get the thing done like now i have a deadline you know noon on saturdays i gotta have it done so it kind of it got me thinking more on Fridays, like, okay, I need to get that video edited, <laughs> you know, get that thing up there. And we don't, I don't have to put a ton of work into it, but, but Mike, you know, the deal, you know, you get a 
full day of working on Friday and I'm kind of thinking I'd like to do something Friday night. Well, I got to edit the video. Yep. Uh, so it just takes, it just takes some time and uh, well, congrats on the new, on the new gig. How, how is life as a podcaster? How are you, uh, how are you handling that? How long have you been on and, and how are you feeling about it? Uh, well, we're probably six episodes now. So we started at the beginning of the year. Um, I'm enjoying it. Um, it, it's kind of funny because after getting into podcasting like this, uh, I've been listening to back episodes of Ask the Podcast Coach mm -hmm. from Saturdays. Lots of valuable information for anybody oh, yeah. thinking about podcasting. You know, that's a great show to listen to. Answers a lot of questions. And, you know, um, the funny part is I work on radio as well. Um, mm -hmm. And the radio, because of COVID, starting to pivot into remote broadcasting. Mm. And the stuff they're talking about now and what we're transitioning into is what podcasters have been doing for years. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're now starting to talk about what kind of mics to do at home and sound quality at home and remote Setups. broadcasting and internet. And I'm like, yep. you know what? You guys need to listen to like ask the podcast coach because they answer all these questions. And it's interesting. Oh, thanks. Well, thanks. I, you know, I love, I just love ha hanging out on Saturday mornings with Dave Jackson and we just have a good time. And it's a little different than your, you know, it's more, it's like this show. It's just kind of more opinion, chatter, yeah. lifestyle kind of stuff than your highly technical review shows. There's plenty of those. And uh, I just enjoy getting uh, together. So thanks for thanks for listening to that. Well, if you need a new podcast, if you're listening, and you need another podcast to listen to. Head out to hometech.fm and get subscribed on that as well. And Gavin, thanks for coming back. We want to spend some time uh, tonight. This will be the last time you hear my voice. Uh, we <laughs> want to spend... <laughs> We just spent a little time uh, tonight talking about kind of uh, security cam setup. And and Gavin, you kind of went on a journey through this. You've been putting some new stuff in. Why don't you just get us started with kind of kind of you know let's start us at the beginning. What were you what were you doing? Why were you doing it? Just kind of get us going with what uh, what your project was. Well, uh, my original beginning beginning, I started off putting in um, ring cameras. So a ring floodlight, ring doorbell. Um, I grabbed wise cameras. And my main reason for all that was it's the popular thing. You know, everyone's talking about it. Everyone's recommending it. It was the popular thing to do. You know, the wise were so cheap. Um, and, you know, it lasted a while, but I grew out of it. Uh, like usual things, I will want to do more with it. And those ecosystems are so locked down. There's only so much I could do with it. So I'm no longer running those devices well okay but before we move on to the you know to the the more options i'm a ring guy and i i actually like the simplicity of it mike you and i did some stuff with some cameras early on i had some dealing cameras where you could monitor them stuff and it was it is a little bit of an endless hole we're going to talk mm -hmm. about that like all the rabbit trails you can go down and once i put ring in and you know i can bring up you know now rings website is really kind of the best place to go to monitor those they're not live and in real time so you're not seeing you know you're not seeing live shots of what's going on there but about every 10 minutes you get a refresh on some of those i really like that but gavin i get it like it could because i hang around Uyghur a lot i i get the fact you always like to be messing with the upgrade and you like to be kind of expanding on it okay so you thought okay i'm gonna do something different keep going so I decided to do something different. So I started researching cameras that had uh, open API because my requirements were I wanted a one. I wanted to settle on a single brand and I wanted that brand to offer all the cameras that I wanted. So I wanted a floodlight cam, a doorbell cam, and then just regular, you know, what they call it, bullet cameras um, and then even indoor cameras. So and I wanted an API and the API, I wanted something open that I can tap into that i can use it for other things uh integrate it with other things so that was a, a lot of research there um a lot of cameras don't have this or their api is half baked or you know and then later on i also found out make sure you get cameras with dual streams and i'll explain why later right so that was a key thing that i kind of lucked out when i also found the brand i set, settled with so i had my requirements going in um and one of the requirements i was really picky on was the color temperature of the bulbs from the floodlight cams too. Um, I, I like the bright white. I'm like the 5,000 Kelvin type person. A lot Almost of people don't blue. like that. Yeah, a lot of people Almost don't blue. like that, but I like that and I want it to be uniform around the house. So I wanted it to look uniform. So that was another thing um, that I was looking at. And not a lot of brands have everything that I uh, was looking for. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Do you get the feeling? And Mike chime in on this too. I think we're finally now just now getting to the spot where the camera setups, like where you could probably go with one kind of camera or one family of cameras for all the stuff that you want to do, whether you want to do go to the ring route or go more of the DIY kind of stuff. Mike, do you, you you've looked through all these. Uh, is that true? Is my, it, yeah. No. When it comes to those, I think you can, I mean, I think most of the brands now are coming out with the majority of the different models and everything like that. Right. It's funny, Gavin, that you said you were wanting to be able to focus in on kind of one brand. My whole reasoning for going with the the more advanced setup was to just have a melting pot. Like, hey, grab a cheap one from China. Grab this. Grab that. Doesn't matter because they're all open and I can I can run it. I long story short, I ended up finding a brand that works for me. And I'm very curious to find out what your brand is. Um, you know, but something like like Tony and Chat mentions that the, his Simply Safe cameras are terrible and i completely agree so i love the simply safe security system um but their cameras are just you can tell they're an afterthought um their their form factor is terrible they never connect uh very well so my doorbell even i think i'm i think i'm going to switch doorbells because the simply safe one it just it, their video back end whatever they're doing to capture video from all of their cameras is is really bad so i think some brands definitely better than others i think ring has this pretty much nailed down um you have arlo right who are kind of known for being the completely wireless battery operated ones um, so if you're okay swapping batteries and if you can get the signal strong enough, that might be a good option. Um, so I think a few of them have their niches, right? Like Ring is the whole ecosystem. Um, Arlo is wireless and on battery. Um, you know, this, so I think each of them have a, have a specialty, but in the end, I think they're all starting to expand to have all the different options. Even Simply Safe just added, you know, an outdoor version of their camera, which they didn't yeah. have before. I just get this feeling like the eco, they we're starting to close in on those ecosystems and they've just gotten a lot better. So, Gavin, what did you, where did you land? I ended up going with Foscam um, for all my cameras. Um, they offered everything I wanted, and their <clears throat> sorry floodlight cameras weren't looking like futuristic floodlight cameras. If that makes sense, they look like a normal floodlight with a camera on it. Um, they they have a open API integration, all local, dual streams. They met all my requirements, right? So in the end, I went with Foscam. I grabbed the floodlight. I have a bullet. I have indoor. I have um also a doorbell, um, and it, it works really well. And so I went the brand and I haven't actually had, I've been wanting to install a floodlight, but I don't have anywhere on my house where that was like pre-installed and they're running the old version of floodlight or anything like that. Um, so I've been using Amcrest. That's kind of the, I've been, had really good luck with Amcrest. I'm trying, I think Rio link was the brand that I bought a few and just, man, I was always having issues with real link ones. And it was especially with blue iris, like dropping frames and stuttering. You would view it in its web browser and it would be totally fine. And then, but it would always have issues with blue iris or sidehound. Um, so I kind of settled in on, on Amcrest, but I will say I've had one Foscam camera and it was fantastic. It was just one of the indoor ones. And what I loved about it was just how crystal clear it was. I thought that one had some of the best image quality uh, for what I was pulling in, um, yeah. had decent audio. And it's funny, that one actually got left on and under a blanket and overheated, uh, turned all brown and stuff on the back. Uh, th this little one ran really hot. Mm -hmm. So I don't have that one anymore. Um, I actually had no idea that Foscam had as many options until Jim actually, you said it, Gavin, and then Jim was just scrolling through the website there. Uh, I didn't know they were as full featured. I probably need to look more into uh, some of the Foscam options because I really did enjoy the indoor one that I had. I do have an Am Amcrest um, floodlight in the basement because that was the first one I actually bought when I was doing through because they have also an open API that's pretty good, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I didn't like the color of the the bulbs when I hooked it up and everything. It didn't match the rest of the house and they don't offer the bright white um, version of it. So I kind of went back to researching and that's when I landed on Foscam. So how many did you end up buying? Um, like all my projects, I break it out. Um, I look for deals. I wait till it goes on deals. When there's a deal, um, I buy one, maybe two. Um, in total, I have about 10 cameras. Um, and it's a mix of different types of cameras. And some of them I sourced from the States. Some of them I got from in Canada. Why, what, why just price? Is it... 
U.S. versus Canada? Is it just based solely on price? I couldn't get some of them in Canada. Um, the floodlights I can't get in camera, but uh, in Canada, but I ordered them from Foscam Mall, where the indoor cameras I got from AAR Tech, which are our local smart home dealer that's very popular up here. Um, so it was just a matter of sourcing, and so I monitor the website and they went on some crazy deals and whenever they did that grab one or two and i did that over time and i got everything at, at least some kind of discount is this a good deal so there's this buy one get one free this foscam g2 yep. 1080p wi-fi surveillance home cam 70 bucks for two is that a pretty good yeah deal? they always have deals so like that's the deal right now but they had that similar deal before on other cameras too um i have one of the um the pan tilt ones it's really good um even even the foscam floodlight there it's 140 right now um i think i got it at 110 right so the weird thing about their 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 website is the prices fluctuate they keep going mm -hmm. in there and adjusting it so it's been as high as 170 for that floodlight i got it at 110 and i just bought a few of them at a time so you just keep refreshing every day and you'll see it change. Kind of keep checking. Did you go with the doorbell as well? Yep, I got the doorbell as well. Okay. The doorbell. Okay, that that's what I need. And that that's what I need right there is uh probably that doorbell. How much is that one? 120. That's 130, not bad. 30. But okay. but what you're saying is keep looking like they're moving prices around all the time. This Yeah, so cool. that's not the sale price right now, but then you can right. see you save an extra $30 when you apply the coupon oh, above. Oh, there you go. Look at that. So, yeah. look, I just saved you 30 bucks by pointing that out. <laughs> right? <laughs> Click uh, buy. 99 bucks, Uyghur. Yeah. You'll have uh, it bought and installed by the end of the show. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the one thing I was going to mention is what I love about um, people like Foscam and Amcrest is, is they give you options. So the Wi-Fi version, you know, in my head and in my house, the way it's set up, if I'm, if I'm going to put a camera up, I'm going to do POE just yep. because if I'm going to have to run a wire for power anyway, I might as well have that be ethernet and have it not have to clog up all my airwaves um, and Wi-Fi. We all know Wi-Fi, right? It's a education. It can be spotty. And especially on the outside of your house, you're getting pretty far away from your access points. Um, so I would always go wired, but I do have two areas where there's just not a good way to get ethernet run um without getting really complicated so i have two of my cameras are wi-fi um and i actually have my own i have a ssid coming off my unified gear that's just for cameras um because that's on a separate vlan with no internet access um but I, I love that they give the different form factors because that is that is key because in some areas you're just not going to be able to run a wire but anywhere you guys can run a wire even if it's going to be a weekend project uh, i highly recommend getting in that attic spend a weekend just run the ethernet uh get a cheap even uh i have like in my attic i have a super cheap tp link poe switch it's only eight ports but it does the job um and you know what if it burns up i think it was only like 30 bucks 35 bucks or something like that uh i, I would recommend run the wire if you can are yours do you have a mix of wi-fi and wired are you all wired um, I think 90% of them are wireless. Um, oh, really? So you're the opposite of me. I'm the opposite because, um, it was hard to get wires to where they are. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, but I had power where they all are, but to get an ethernet to them, I didn't want to invest in that. But, um, I also have really good, uh, wifi coverage in my house with my unified right. setup. Right. And I offload anything else that's heavy loading on, uh, is wired. So it's just my cameras that are heaviest things on my wifi. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I am really lucky. All my eaves go into my attic, which is accessible from my garage, uh, with actually a decent amount of room up there. The guy before me had laid down kind of some, some, uh, you know, wood up there so you can walk around, you can put storage. So I just got super lucky that mine's all pretty, I have a, you know, smaller house ranch style, easy to get up there, easy to put all your cameras. And that's the other thing about, you know, a ranch style home. And you'll probably talk about this as camera placement is really important. Um, sometimes in an eve of a two-story house, that's too high and not as usable, right? As that person gets close, you're at a very bad angle. You're looking at the top of their head. Um, so you talk about the different aspects of security systems and identification is a big part of that. If you can get into that zone. Um, and, and yeah, so it's just, I, I got, I kind of got lucky. I kind of got the perfect house for a DIY install of these cameras. Well, and you got a sweet patio in the back. That's 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 also I, good. I, I do like the patio in the back. It's a, it's it's a a sweet, I have two uh, cameras watching that back patio. It's yeah, a sweet <laughs> patio in the back. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it, for me. You know, I, I mentioned I'm on Ring, and I have three cameras, and I really want a fourth, not for extra security, but because I have this big gap on when I'm viewing the the cameras. Like, 
you know, one, two, three, and then there's a square that just is begging for a camera. So because I'm a completist and I like those kinds of things that way, I'm like, I, I just got to buy another camera. And then I think, uh, where would I put it? Like, I don't really, there's not another spot for me that would, would really kind of make sense. So sometimes we get a little silly on, on those kinds of things. However, I do have a slick deals alert set for it just so I can, uh, I can get it when it gets there. Gavin, um, are, so does, um, uh, do they have their own software? What are you using then? So you've got these cameras around. What are you, what are you using to kind of monitor it and record it and some of those kinds of things? So they do have their own software. And the, the, one of the reasons why I like to, I wanted to settle on one brand is because when you settle on one brand, it's easier to support it. So you'll know the updates, you'll understand the updates, you know, easier to track updates and things like that, or things that go wrong. You know, that brand inside out where I don't want to do that for 10 different brands, but, um, they do have their own software. It's pretty pretty good. The only thing I don't like about it is it pushes their cloud offering a bit too much in the software. So seeing the local recordings off the cards is a few more clicks in it. Um, but it actually looks and runs pretty well. Um, but I actually use Blue Iris. All the cameras are fed through Blue Iris and I use the Blue Iris app and software for everything. Extra charge for that, or how does that work for the Foscam software? No, yeah, for no yeah. to use the Blue Iris software. Oh, the Blue Iris is always going to cost you more money, so you have to invest in hardware first to run it on, and then the the license for Blue Iris is, I think it was fifty bucks. I got a deal Canadian. That's Canadian, so, so um, like everything dollars. everything I talk about is in Canadian dollars yeah, and in dollars. Celsius. Just remember that. No, right. Just discount it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, if it's fifty dollars, then it's forty dollars US or whatever. It's usually yeah. it's that would be interesting. Coming. I haven't done a price comparison recently. I know back. I mean, there is the upfront investment to do something like Blue Iris is heavy, right? Because you need the hardware to run it on. I think a lot of us, you know, home gadget nerds here, we have maybe a server running you could spin up a VM on, or we have that extra uh, Optiplex box collecting dust that we could put it on. But if you don't, there is a cost there. There is the cost for Blue Iris. But overall, I the cameras, I think, are much more affordable than you're going to pay for Ring. And then no monthly subscription, which is kind of nice. So over time, um, I, I think it's, you know, if, you, if it is something you're going to keep around for a while, uh, it could end up saving you money in the future, depending. I, I've always liked the cheaper camera options. The Amcrest ones I go with, the 4K ones, are usually around $70. Um, if you catch them on a sale on Amazon, between $50 and $70, bucks, which uh, which a pre pretty good deal for some of these. Sign up for cameras. their mailing list, the Amcrest mailing list, if you're interested oh, in those, oh, and just wait. And just wait, they're going to email you deals almost weekly and okay. you just grab them when you, when you see them. That's good. Cause I have two more old ones that aren't Amcrest yet. that need to go. They need to get replaced <laughs> in the, in the back. It's actually the ones that are on Wi-Fi right now. Did Jim, I'm still running that D link camera. It still runs out. It's been outdoors for years. It's on that back patio. Now yeah, it's covered. It doesn't yeah. get wet. Uh, but it's still outdoors. Nothing. I think I think, I, think I got rid of the two that I had. They were causing a huge Wi-Fi interference. Here. Oh really? They yeah, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. So they were. I just was like, yeah, I'm not gonna. They when we put Ring in, uh, Ring was just wouldn't work very well, and and it was just by mistake. I turned off those cameras, and all of a sudden it started working, and I was like, what the? So I started doing some looking into it, and then I ran some kind of Wi-Fi analyzer, and just realized these things were being super noisy. Yeah, yeah. And so on the on the Wi-Fi space, because they so, they never stop spitting out their own Wi-Fi network, yeah. even when they're connected to a different right. Wi-Fi network. It's yeah, weird. it's super noisy. So I will like, put. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, you go. Well, so I will put one link to in the chat to a video. There's a guy on YouTube called The Hookup, and uh, he's really good. He does a lot on these sort of cameras and Blue Iris, and he was actually, I think Gavin's going to talk here a bit about his setup. And and when I was first learning about this, um, this was a guy I learned from, but he has a recent video, just came out two weeks ago, on kind of common mistakes people make when they're first getting into home security cameras. And I think it would be a really good video for people to watch one of the things he covers is kind of the the four main elements when you're thinking about, you know, putting your zone. So if you were to look top down on your house and your property, right, if you're looking at a Google Maps view of your property, he has kind of, you have detection, observation, recognition, and identification. So the outer perimeter, you just need detection. Are there... Are there things coming into my property that I should just know they're there? That's detection, right? So that's your furthest out zone. And then as they get a little bit tighter, um, then you need the, uh, what is that? What did I say observation? Mm -hmm. uh, 
detection on the outside. And then as they get closer, it's observation, right? Okay. Now I need to start looking at what are they doing? They've kind of come into my property. Are they just walking on the sidewalk? Are they actually, are they getting into my trash bins? What are they doing? And then you start getting into um, the identification portion. There. So recognition would be, I already know someone. Oh yeah, that's, ah, that's Jim. I, I can see that's Jim. I know him. Uh, but it's someone, you know, you know of, right. And then there's identification and that's your closest in zone. They are at my door. And I need to rec- I need to, if I could turn this footage over to the cops, if they do something, they're going to be able to identify them. Um, but what the reason he kind of goes through those zones is that kind of helps you decide what type of cameras you need and where you need certain types of cameras. And I think, Gavin, you'll probably talk about this. Um, but the types of cameras you use for that, just that general detection zone is way different than identification zone right? Because those are gonna be different cameras, maybe wide angle versus very focused in um, those sort of things. Uh, so I'll, I'll put a link to that. I'll have Jim put it in the show notes. It was a really, really well done video where I thought he covered camera placement. Um, he talks about, you know, a lot of people tend to, you know, you're showing way too much sky, you don't need any sky in your camera, you know, to tilt those down, uh, those sort of things. So that'll be a good video um, for people who are just getting started, no matter what brand you go with. If you're going with a self-hosted system, if you're going with a, a cloud system, just in general, really good security camera video. My doorbell is seeing sky, but I can track the moon on it as it, as it traverses. <laughs> so it's worth it. <laughs> it's kind of cool. It. Uh, Blue Iris looks like 70 US, that's full price, 70 US for their um, full version. And then they have a light version uh, for 35, 15 day demo if you want to give it a try. Uh, Bob was asking this question. Gavin, I'll throw it to you. What's a really good night camera with about a hundred foot range? Presumably, that's like 30 meters. Presumably IR blaster built in, PoE to be used with Blue Iris. Any any thoughts? Uh, honestly, I it's hard to say because I haven't tested every camera out there, yeah. right? Like It's almost like you got to look at reviews and do a lot of research to find out what exactly you're looking for. Um, I've seen people say, use, um, don't use the IR in the camera, you know, um, put something off to the side to help with that. And it helps eliminate things like snow and rain too, um, triggering alerts. Um, you, you kind of have to look at the reviews and see what people, uh, but, sense. but thinking of a zone too, you just want detection at that range too, right? Yeah. Um, so if you could go with a 4k camera, you could go with a 2k camera. You just want to see something's happening out there. Right. You're not trying to read the license plate at that distance, probably. Yeah, it really does. I mean, this is where it's really specific to your property, <laughs> what yeah. you're expecting to come in that, you know, we have low fences in our backyards. I mean, the whole neighborhood is one big backyard, basically. And it's just low fences, you know, the low chain link fences. Well, I, I, I am worried about people coming through that from that direction. Right. Because it's easy. There's no, the, the barrier to entry is pretty easy. So I, I do protect my back door and I've got a camera on it just in case we see it that way. But I know some folks where, you know, it, they, they might back up to a field or they've got a really high fence or they, you know, and it's just, it's maybe not a concern. You don't have to go out as far um, uh, with it. So I think every situation is a little bit, a little bit different. Gavin, when you were doing this and switching, did you do, did you go through a scenario where you might have optimized like, Oh, I learned when I had this, this didn't really work very well. I want to put a different camera in now that I know what I'm doing. Did that give you an opportunity to kind of upgrade uh, some of those cameras in those areas maybe where it wasn't covering it before? Well, it, it gave me the opportunity. Like when I first had the ring and the wise, it gave me the opportunity to know what I really wanted in the camera, right? Like mm-hmm. it, it, the ring and the wise were like, I just want a camera at this point. And then after a while, it was like, well, what doesn't it do for me that I want it to do for me? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I didn't like the color of it, the, the 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 light temperature of it. I didn't like the integration options of it, you know. And I'm not knocking ring or wise; they're great cameras. Wise has one of the best night vision cameras in their Wise V3. It's a beautiful camera. And I actually installed Ring at my mom's house. She has all my Ring cameras now, you know, and I gave my sister all my Wise cameras. So they're, you know, they're all being used still. It's just, I just want to take it to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why, why wouldn't you? Right. Yeah. That's what we do. We yeah. take it to the next level, right? That's, that's what we do. So you've got 10, 10 cameras. You, yes. You're, you're bringing them in. You're using blue Iris for that. Yep. What's give, walk us through a little bit of like 
it's is every camera real time all the time are you recording every single second give us kind of walk us through that what do, what do you kind of keep so my hardware I'm running, I'm running on a really old PC. It's probably another 10 year old PC, an i5 maybe. Um, and it doesn't have uh, any special video card or anything in it. Um, I threw a SSD for the main operating system in there. And I threw um, a Western digital purple drive to handle all the recordings for storage. And that that's my setup. Now I have 10 cameras fed it, feed it, that feed into that. All 10 of those cameras are recording all the time. Right. So I have uh, on the drive, I have about four terabyte. I get about three weeks worth of recording. Right. But I also have in Blue Iris, you can create copies of the cameras. Right. So I have the original cameras or the recording cameras, and I kind of hide those away. And then I have the copies that then now do the triggers and the alerts. So when you're using the app, you're not seeing the full time recordings, you're just seeing the alert. And if anybody ever comes to me and says something happened on our road at this time or whatever, I can then go back to the full time recordings. We don't monitor those, but they're there just in case something happens. So the camera, when you're looking at your monitor and it's got all the cameras on it, it's just showing the last time the camera had an alert on it. Yeah. Well, if right? I'm looking at my monitor, I see the real time feeds. Okay. Right. But when you're using the uh, the app and everything and it shows got the it. alerts, it's only showing the alerts, not the recordings. Yeah. And that's very different than ring, right? With ring, yep. you're always looking at just the, you know, some snapshot you can kind of configure that, but some sh snapshot from five minutes ago or three minutes ago or whatever. And, and the alerts, I wish that would kind of on the, on the website, I wish it would tell me if it had an alert. So I would know to go click on it. Right. That, yep. kind, of, that kind of deal. There's some, there are some, you know, in the app, you get the little number that's up there. So you can, you can kind of see, Oh, there's three or four alerts there. So it, it does work um, in that way. Okay. Well, that kind of makes sense. That purple drive though, that you said a four terabyte, right? Four terabyte yeah. purple drive. That thing's got to be getting slammed to have that much real time recording, right? Is it handling it pretty well? Hey, it's been handling it perfectly fine. Like that, that, sir, that computer just buzzed along just fine. Um, it's meant for that though. Um, the purple drives are meant for the uh, NVRs, um, so that's why I went with the purple drive because they are meant for constant recording like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, purple are those security drives, and I do the same thing um, with on even through Sighthound. But so mine is a VM on Unraid. Uh, ring the bell. I said Unraid. Um, <laughs> but uh -oh. mine's running on a VM. We let, and I just have we let one the horse out of the barn. Here we yeah, go. I did. I did. <laughs> um, I just, but I don't have it writing to the array. I just have one unassigned disk. It's just a four terabyte spinner in there, and that four terabyte spinner is only used by that VM just to store footage. Um, but because Jim, I was kind of concerned with you. I didn't want the array being, you know, all the wear and tear on the array drives. Um, so I just threw in one of my oldest four terabyte drives because realistically that thing could reset every day and odds are I'd be just fine. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. like, well, what are the odds? I have to go look through, except for uh, when that car came driving through my front yard the other week, that was mm. really nice to have four different camera angles of that guy. Um, did anything, anything become of that? Did they find no, anybody? Sadly or? not. They did not find anyone. they caused havoc throughout the entire neighborhood and, and never got the guy. So Make sure none of us had good enough angles on the, on the you, license you need to plate. put some tank things in your yard now. Yeah, so. some anti anti car <laughs> things. I, yeah, I do. Well, because it's so Disguise funny, the cracks are still there. I was just really? yesterday out with my neighbor yeah. looking, and we're like, just wait till in the spring we turn our sprinkler system, and I guarantee we'll have some busted Ooh. heads. Yeah, uh, from him driving to the lawn. So, uh, but yeah, I, I do the same sort of thing. Just that one drive, and I'm surprised those drives last forever. I mean, I've been using the same four terabyte drive ever since I started self hosting security cameras. Uh, a few just years don't ago. turn it off. Right. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Just don't don't have it stop. The fact that it just loves being spun all the it time. Just keeps. It, are those high speed drives? Or are those low speed drives? Do you know? They're they're fifty four hundreds. So they're low. Speed yeah, drives. yeah. They're they're not. They don't need to be performance drives. Just right, right. in storage. Right. And those fifty four hundreds, uh, the Seagate version, they call they call them something cool, extra cool, something cool, but because they because they run slower, they run the heat wise. They just don't yeah, generate. A, I didn't think about that. Drive. So if you've got something spinning all the time, there is some value to having it not spin as fast, creates less heat, drive lasts a little bit longer. Um, I bought a bunch of those when I was doing some, you know, crypto mining on hard drives. Uh, I, I favored those drives because they're spinning all the time and they run, they use a little less energy that way too um, as well. So how long, Gavin, how long are you holding on to your video footage? Because I imagine with four terabytes, you could get, 
quite a bit on there before it goes away. How, how, how long do you keep stuff for? Uh, well, I just have it to use the drive. So however long I get, and I think I get about three weeks um, of, of full-time storage and then plus all the notifications and it will auto clean out the old stuff and put the new stuff in. That's good like for three percentage. cameras or 10 cameras. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I, I was expecting three days. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to be like, well, it's like 72 hours, but really it's like 24. Uh, but, but no, that's a lot. So what's the res? Uh, are all the cameras different resolution or is it all the same? Um, they vary. I have some that are 2k. I think most are 2k. I think some of the indoor ones are even lower than that. And I think I have one 4k camera. So it, it, it's all varies. Yeah. Okay. Well, and this is where Gavin and I were chatting, you know, in pre-show, because uh, kind of the, the two of the main players are are Blue Iris is like the end-all, be-all, most powerful, most popular. Um, and then there's Sighthound, and you guys have heard me mention that. So the only the difference in storage is on Sighthound, you set the amount of time you want everything saved for. So every single second, no matter if it detects anything, whatever, it's going to save. So I have that set to 72 hours. And then after that, it's so it's rolling those 72 hours and deleting, and then it's just saving anything that you told it to. So I have it save any movement of anything because I, I mean, even when a car drives by, I don't care, just save any movement. Um, and that saves a ton of space because I've got eight cameras, um, and I think my storage is still not full and it's been going for a couple months. Um, so it just it, it's just different ways to store that, right? When you're only storing 72 hours of every second, and then you're just doing 10. 15 second clips whenever something moves uh, makes it makes a big difference. And so that was one thing that I was trying to tweak with blue Iris. And there are definitely ways you can do it. Um, you could, you know, your long end long storage could be from a sub stream, right? We talked about having two different streams. There's a couple of different ways uh, you could do that. But that was one of the things I, I did like about Sidehound was their, their storage option. Gavin, from an optimization standpoint, uh, cause you're, yeah, I mean, you, when we talked to you last time, you, write code you do all you write stuff with unraid as well what kind of so out of the box what kind of customizations i shouldn't say out of the box after you took it out of the box and installed yeah. it what kind of customizations did you did or how can you what how'd you learn how to optimize because that's a lot of network traffic one second i need to get my notebook first because i know i'm gonna be taking a lot of notes <laughs> during this section I, this is the part i've been most excited for i, I want to hear the the good stuff all the the tweaks you've made and the custom stuff you've done well um one of the things people don't realize is they'll just add a camera to blue iris and you know they'll just add all their cameras on and then they start complaining that the cpu is getting you know running at 90 percent, 100 percent, right um, there is an article i can give you guys later for the show notes on ip cam talk i think it is about optimization and i highly recommend if you're running blue iris read this article and implement everything it says it took my uter i was stubborn at first too i admit my cpu is running at 90 percent, and i was like oh this program sucks no there's tweaks in there and it brought it down from 90 percent down to 20 percent wow. with 10 cameras wow. recording 24 hours plus notifications plus deep stack right so the key, two of the key things is the, um, in, in that article is when you turn on directed disc recording, very important to tweak that. And then using the sub streams, adjusting the sub streams, um, that's where a lot of the utilization goes down. Um, very important to do everything that article says, and you will be a happy camper. Um, I didn't believe it at first. And I just, you know, dove right in and said, I'm going to do everything they say, reducing the frame rate key thing there too because you know on security cameras you don't need a, a high frame rate you know you just need like you can reduce it and you won't even notice it and um it helps with the cpu utilization as well so the cameras out of the box are 30 60 on a frame rate or yeah and you can reduce it down to like uh 15 okay and it still looks great and then there's something called keyframes that you can set to one and it still looks great you will never notice um but it reduces the utilization on the pc and it's important and you can mess with the bit rate too for file size i, mean, I noticed yes. that was always a, a big way and it's always that balance on bit rate and and frames per second and the keyframes just making sure you get them right so you don't get any stuttering yeah, it gets too pixel yeah. to, if it gets too yeah. pixel too right i mean you there's some of those things happen when you know mike think about that car going across the front of your lawn that's happening pretty fast and yep. if you're reducing the frame rate you may miss the the frame that has the license plate in it Right. And and that's where Sighthound versus Blue Iris. Sighthound takes more of an Apple approach, 
we're gonna deal with all of the settings for you they do, yeah. you just come in tell us the camera tell us how long you want to store footage but you don't try and go into the hood and don't try and do ptz and don't try and do two-way communication and don't try and get too fancy with this use our detection and our algorithms don't be trying to integrate anything else and blue iris is like the android approach right where just all the power you could ever want gonna take you a little bit more time maybe to set it up and you're gonna but you're gonna be able to tweak those things if you like to tweak them and that's where blue iris really shines is when you start playing with this stuff getting really good optimization really good storage really good um just overall cpu utilization that that is where blue iris really does start to show it's and, how powerful it can be and one more key tip too i didn't discover this till afterwards with my cameras but my cameras were sending an h265 stream and my computer was struggling with that mm. and i you know i didn't know what to do and then i found out somebody mentioned it in a forum and there's a setting on the camera itself to say this camera is part of an nvr and at that point it switches over to h264 mm. and the computer deals That's with that nice. a lot better because i didn't have a graphics card in there to handle decoding and coding so that also was huge that's not mentioned in the article so if your camera look at what your camera is spitting out if it's spitting out h265 it might be worth just you know going with h264 um and, and you have the higher drive space so i wouldn't worry about that right um and it will help with the cpu as well that's a good catch because those codecs are different yes and so yeah that would that would make sense any other optimizations gavin in there that uh any, anything else you can think of that you did that where someone setting this up that you're like oh yeah i learned this and it's super important anything else those those were the key things um in terms of getting the cpu utilization down and, th and that's the one mistake a lot of people make is they don't really pay attention and it, it just it will kill your cpu if you don't make these especially with the substreams and that's why I say it's very important if you look at cameras, get cameras with the dual streams because it will use one stream to record all the time and then it will use a, a less, um, a, a, the second stream that's not as good of a quality to right. do all its processing on and it keeps the CPU down. And so I, I want to know, there was two things that you had mentioned um, in the show notes and before the show. One was deep stack, right? So motion detection, you know, determining what is it that's moving across. Um, and you talked about some some moving between zones and then obviously integrating this with your TV sounded really cool getting that to pop up. Those are two things that I got to hear about. <laughs> Which one do you want me to start with? <laughs> start start with, well, I think deep stack is important because I okay. think deep stack, like if you're going to use blue iris, I think deep stack is like a requirement at this yep. point to have a really, really good experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. So deep stack, if, if for those not familiar, is uh, AI integration with Blue Iris. So it will do like um, identification of objects. Right. And um, it's a really cool concept because it will send frames from the camera. It's very configurable as well. You can get dirty with open it source, too. right? Yeah, yeah, it's open exactly. source and it integrates well with Blue Iris and it sends frames from the camera and then analyze it. And it will say, yep, that's a dog. Yep, that's a cat. Unless you have a small dog like me, it's always a cat or a bird, right? <laughs> um, that, that's the only thing, right? But it's a great product. Um, it does add CPU utilization. Um, so if you ever go with um, DeepStack, another word of advice, only enable it on the cameras you want it to be enabled on. Mm. So if you want it enabled only on like your front door for face recognition, um, put it on that door only. Don't put it on all the other cameras where you just want motion right um so it, it's really good it's really easy to set up and configure and um you can even get deep into it by using custom models some people post custom models where they basically gather a whole bunch of their own pictures and train it so that it knows how to recognize dogs better or it can recognize objects in the dark better there's dark models mm. um specific so it'll pick up things better in the dark so you know you might want to look into that if you ever go down it's another rabbit hole you can go down no, but that's that that idea is really really cool. You know, yep. where you're getting some help. Like, yeah, this picture we wouldn't normally recognize it, but this is definitely a dog, and then it can it can help pick up on that. Um, I imagine that additional utilization is it sending those pictures to their service that or or it's it's done. In, the processing is done on locally. Your okay, it's all locally because okay. the models you can download, you put in the deep stack Got folder, etc., etc. Et et and does deep stack come with a set of models? already yep. and you can you can add to it okay so yeah it comes with default models um but some people have uh, 
better luck with their own custom yeah. models and they yeah. train their own stuff. And I mean, you can get really dirty where you can see how it processed that video when you got an alert to see how it mm -hmm. identified it and what model was identifying it. And that's how they train it better. Mike, we, when we were working with Sighthound, they've got some, they're doing this on the server side, I yeah. think, right on their server side. And they've got some crazy, I mean, that you can see the boxes around and then you can see it processing kind of like, Hey, this is okay. It's a dog or whatever. Um, well, that's, that's okay. fascinating. Side, that's doing it on your local machine. It's local on, there too. On Sighthound well. it okay. is. Okay. What Sighthound's doing is Sighthound kind of switched their focus. They came out with this product um, being, being Sighthound video, the NVR. And then they really kind of pivoted their business to being server cloud hosted AI kind of that sort of modeling for, you know, companies would send the data there, it gets analyzed, it gets sent back um, and providing that sort of system. And so now they've promised to bring all the improvements they've made back to the Sidehound video application. And maybe they'll end up doing that someday. They've been promising it for uh, a few years. They also said they were shutting down their forum like two years ago, and I think it's still <laughs> up. So uh, I don't know that that is the one thing I'll forewarn people. Before you fork out $250 for the unlimited license version of Sidehound, uh, just just know that the uh, the history of updates has been slowing dramatically. Mm. Uh, so I'm very happy with the product the way it is. And the, the good thing about Sighthound, actually, the thing I didn't mention, it runs on Mac. So that is another reason. If you have a, if you are a Mac household, um, Blue Iris does not run on a on a Mac, I don't believe. Um, but Sighthound will run on a Mac and Windows. Gavin, when you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but of, of course you live in a land of snow, lots of snow. Sometimes these, I've not actually had any problems with rain or snow on the ring cameras of getting a false. You, yeah. you alluded to it earlier. Have you had any, so now that you've had these for a little while, do you have any problems with, with weather related? I, sometimes I get alerts based on um, shadows. Yes. Which sounds kind of weird, right? But it thinks the shadow is something. Um, have you had any problems with those so far? That's always uh, one of the tough things with when it comes to like these cameras and motion alerts and stuff like that. Um, yes, uh, snow and rain is a tough one, um, mainly because the IR sensors in the camera are right in front of where the lens is. So all those things are bright. You know, it sees it. Um, some people say what you can do is turn off the IR on the camera and get an external IR and set that away from the camera somewhere um like a couple feet away and use that to illuminate the area and the camera will still see perfectly fine you'll probably get even better video doing it that yeah, way that's a really good idea like i you you mentioned that earlier and i thought yeah that is a real i should like in it it would take a lot to have just a separate ir camera plugged in somewhere right away from the camera flooding the area you, you could put it it's it's almost you can't see it when you're outside you can't see it like we yeah. We don't pick it up, but it can. You can just basically flood the area, and that would help the cameras. Mike, have you have you thought about that? Do you have any? Have you had any trouble with your IR stuff? Because yeah, especially I, if it's behind a piece of glass. Oh, right? for sure. I, yeah, I don't yeah. even know how you got away with that one for as long as you did. Uh, the IR is going. It's a very just. It's a learned thing. You got to experience it and figure out how your yard works um, and how your system works. The one thing that I've kind of learned with IR is kind of what Gavin said, play with other ways of getting light into the area um, besides using the IR. And also just IR bounces off things, right? So if you if, if your camera can even see a glimmer of like the wall it's next to or the eave, it bounces right back into that camera and washes everything out, um, right? And so, so you're going to be done there. Um, it, so IR is a very finicky thing. There are a few new cameras that are trying to do color night vision, which is kind of intriguing and kind of interesting. Um, from what I've read, I haven't used one of these, but from what I've read, um, might be better just to stick with regular IR for those, you know, needing it in color versus having a clearer image and a more decipherable image that IR might work a little better. Uh, but this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? With observation, detection, recognition, identification, what are you trying to do for each individual scenario? I have not even considered the idea of blasting with some sort of other IR light. Uh, I've been trying to blast it with regular light, and I'm sure my neighbors are getting a little upset with me <laughs> uh, by really lighting up the outside of my house. But I didn't even think about the IR. That's yeah. a great idea. And another thing I've done to help eliminate when it comes to snow and rain. So snow, it comes 
from the top down, right? Sometimes in uh, my camera, I'll see it go sideways a little bit, depending on the wind. So with blue iris, you can create zones, right? And what I do is I create like a zone at the bottom and a zone in the, in the middle, right? And I say only trigger if something goes from zone at the bottom to the zone at the top. So mm -hmm. snow coming down will not trigger it, but my dog running out the door will trigger it. That's smart. Right. And I got around that from triggering my cameras in snowstorms and rainstorms. Every now and then I get a, a you know a little snowflake that goes down and back up again and triggers it. <laughs> you know, it depends yeah. on the wind, but yeah. it eliminated most of my things using zone crossing. Yeah. I was just thinking my my one intriguing one is my camera. I have a camera right out in my backyard, but where it's positioned, I didn't even think about this because I set this up in the summer. Winter came around. And I'm like, what is this? Like, what is? It looks like smoke. It looks like smoke on fire out there. It's right above where my dryer vent exits out, and that <laughs> that humidity just hits the cold air and goes straight up, and it literally just looks like smoke. So that camera's pretty much useless in the winter time. Uh, anytime my wife's doing laundry, because it's it's just yeah, it's all smoked out. Looks like we have a house fire going on. But that was an interesting one. That one took me a second at first when I saw it. I'm like, I have no idea what's causing that. <laughs> then I was like, oh yeah, that's where the dryer vent comes out. We we always see the neighbor's cat smudge come across our deck he he kind of owns the neighborhood so he he comes in the summer he's laying all over the place we, we we get we get all these smudge pictures uh of him out there um gavin i i uh I, I lured you away from this question but mike wanted to hear about it showing up on your television so what are you doing alerts go off talk a little bit about what you're doing there so Blue Iris has uh, the ability to integrate with a lot of stuff. You, you know, you can get, if something triggers it, you can have it act on that trigger. So my, all my TVs in my house, they run off the front end I use is um, Kodi. And that's the front end to it. My back end server is actually MB. And, but I use Kodi as the presentation. And one of the features in Kodi, I, I have a plugin that I wrote that will take a call and 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 get a stream url and then display that in a little corner of the this tv um yes. you know so what happens is if somebody comes to my front door and they ring the doorbell that triggers on my habitat hub that hey the doorbell rang send that call over to Co cody and then cody connects to my blue iris and pulls in the feed and shows you on the screen until you dismiss it Right. And it shows up on all the TVs or whichever TVs are on at the time. And similar, I do something similar with zone crossing. Whereas if somebody's walking up my driveway towards my house, it will do the same thing. And I can see my drive. It'll send the driveway feed to the TV so I can see someone. But if they're walking down the driveway or it's other motion, it won't trigger because I only use it if they're walking up. And I can you can even use the AI and say if it's a person walking up, then trigger, you know, that type of I stuff. I love that. Yeah. That's so genius. It, um, for those out there that say I don't use Kodi, I have Android front ends. I've seen on Reddit people mention being able to do this on Android using another app. Um, I don't remember the app, but I'm pretty sure if you look for it over on Reddit, Home Automation, um, you'll see them mention this other app that does the same thing. It will take a feed. It will show it in the corner on your Android box and then disappear after a certain amount of time. You know... Uh, what this got me thinking of too was the one feature I do kind of think is pretty cool with like Ring. I think it's Ring. Uh, does Google own Ring? Is that the one they they own or no, Nest? Uh, or Amazon, Amazon own Ring or and Amazon. Google owns Nest. Yeah. So on on either of those, where you ask the device, show me the front door camera, yeah. and if you have one of them with the with the screen, it just shows it. Like I think that's that's pretty handy. Um, because you know what do I do? Is I pull out my phone and I go to that one camera and and I see it. And you know what that got me thinking? I was like, how far are we for, you know, we, okay. So we self host deep stack, right. In a Docker container or, or in windows or whatever. Uh, are you running on windows, but is that what are all this is running it's on, on windows? windows? Yeah, it's okay. on a window um, you know, will we be able to self host like a, like a smart device and have essentially like a, a home assistant that never goes outside the bounds of your network? Cause man, that would just be really, really cool to have kind of a self hosted smart device that and then you could and then you could integrate it with your blue iris and pull from all your locally hosted stuff i'm sure there's got to be a project out there being worked on so you're looking um, at you're talking about like self-hosting a smart hub or something a, a hub essentially yeah like think of like a, a self-hosted um 
a lady uh, alexa right? oh you're talking like a audio a voice An audio yeah, yeah where she's responding but you're doing all that processing in the home locally and so if there some, is people worried about tracking and the recordings of everything going on in your home like if you had a self-hosted version that never left the bounds of your network that'd be pretty interesting and then i could think you could you know everything that you're doing to integrate with the tv that's all happening because it's in your land. And I'm like, oh man, okay, well then you could start, you know, really having some fun. I don't know. I, I That was the first time I'd ever thought, and oh, like, that would be a good use case for local self-hosted assistant. So if, you, if you're interested in that, people have projects out there, but there is one commercial product called um, josh.ai. Um, okay. But it's out of our, <laughs> probably out of our salary range, right? That's all I have to say. I looked at it, um, but they do have self-hosting. It's all integrated in the home. It has AI built in. It learns your ways or, you know, it has its own language and stuff like that. Um, you have to buy it through a dealer, but it's a really cool looking product. Um, I can't afford it, uh, <laughs> but it exists if you're ever looking for that. Alex uh, says uh, Apple HomeKit plus HomeBridge. We'll do that. Is there an integration on Hubitat for, for um? Uh, I know you're a Hubitat guy, right, yep. Gavin? Uh, are you? Do you have this integrated in with Hubitat at all, and and have any actions going? Yeah, I have it fully integrated with Hubitat. So all 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 my cameras show up, and I wrote this integrated m integration myself. So I don't know if there's one in the community, but all my cameras show up in Blue Iris as devices that have motion and audio sensors. Right. So I can act on motion and audio as needed. So like one of the things I do is if motion um, is in the backyard from anything. Right. It's oh, turns on all my backyard camera, all my backyard lights. Right. Um, and the reason I do that is because when I let out the dog, I don't we get a lot of raccoons and stuff out there. So I wanted to know that if the lights are on, there's an animal out there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I also use the deep stack is I say only turn it on if an animal is detected at the side of the house and stuff so the leaves blowing around won't trigger it and stuff like that but it's i have it fully integrated with um habitat even down to the point where i got like images showing up on my dashboard that i control the whole smart home with this is my problem with having you on though gavin because when you whenever i hear someone cool you're like oh yeah i wrote that myself I'm like of course you did of course oh, you wrote that yourself <laughs> Listen, ever need i'll share yeah. it with you <laughs> okay perfect perfect bob uh, bob carpenter says i wonder if someone has trained blue iris to detect ice cream trucks you could detect that, trucks. Yeah. You can detect truck. Like it's funny because some in the modeling, um, they actually have detect. It's weird why they have banana, a camel. You know, it's like why did they train it to even notice that? But they, you can train it. Um, there's documentation out there how to create your own modeling, so it would only learn ice cream trucks and notify you of that. I, I have that built-in detection with a four-year-old and a five-year-old. I swear <laughs> they can hear those things coming from a mile away. Yeah. Dad, run inside. Yeah. We have out. Come on, please. Can I get some in this time? We haven't I, seen I, an ice cream truck in my neighborhood in a hundred years. I, I don't. Well, last this summer month, we saw one quite a few really? in our neighborhood. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We just we just don't we just don't see one around here. I was I was thinking, man, so when's the last time I saw an ice cream truck? It's, Ours it's, is actually. We see the Kona guy more often. There's like a Kona truck that drives through our neighborhood. Kona Ice um, does like the the freeze ice yeah. with the flavoring yeah, on yeah. top. And yeah, we yeah. see that guy quite a bit. Listen, I wish a taco truck would come through my neighborhood on a regular basis. Like I'd buy tacos right off the, like, yeah, I would be running out with the kids. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So, oh, you know, burrito truck coming driving yeah. through game over Last year before or year before when covid hit we actually contacted a food truck and had um a, a food truck come to our neighborhood park in front of our house and we let the whole neighborhood know that That's these the, the grilled cheese guys are coming um place your order and it will be here on friday for three hours and they came and everybody they sold out it was ridiculous mm. and it was a nice little in the middle of covid type of thing yeah. we did and oh, we yeah. did for, yeah, for sure. we did for charity so people brought like donations and stuff and we gave it to a local food idea. bank so if you ever you know if you ever need an idea to get to know your neighbors meet your neighbors that's great great that's one there idea. that is a good idea we do that our work will bring in the food trucks they'll you know every i think during the summer it's like every tuesday and wednesday there's food trucks out there but that's a really good idea to do the neighborhood um, our park's been doing a few things like that, but yeah, you're right. Good way to get everyone out of the house. And especially during. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Uh, Bob says have a taco and ice cream truck travel in a group, parents and children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, yep. that's working out. I'm getting hungry now. <laughs> uh, Alex says our neighborhood did a food truck thing as well. 
Um, yeah, I, I would, uh, it, you know, somebody taco truck came down the street with a little music plan. I'd go ride. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Stop. It's so good. So good. Uh, uh, Tony says, uh, we had one do it for a while in the cul-de-sac. Mike, you got it. You're, I mean, you're on the cul-de-sac, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We're gonna, later, uh, they wanted to guarantee a 1500 bucks. Yeah. Cool. It, you know, they, they uh, got a, you know, yeah, their minimums to drive out yeah. there to repair it, to have the food right. ready for that. I mean, that's... well, and this is one of those things where it's really popular the first time or two. And then, yeah. uh, People are kind of like, well, I don't know. You know, we had so, ours. Ours all called in in advance and placed their yeah. orders before that day. So yeah. he called us the day and he says we're sold out. So everybody coming to pick it up. That's all we have. Right. So, right. Right. Yeah. No. Good stuff. So you get alerts. They pop. They just because of Cody and uh, they just pop onto your TV. Isn't does do, how many alerts do you get? It's only specific alerts. Okay. And then it's only um, if someone rings, physically rings the doorbell, because okay. that's when you want to see what's at the front right. door. Right. And then only if someone's walking up the driveway, right? Okay. It, okay. it will show up. And even that one, I just limit to a couple TVs, just really my office and the gym TV. Yeah. Um, on the main TV, I don't care if someone's walking up the driveway, really. The uh, the ring cameras now have an integration with the website. So if you're logged into the website, you can enable notifications. And when somebody pops in, it will throw the video up on your, as a notification up on your screen. So that's, I've taken advantage of that. They've stopped supporting the Windows app. They just like, no, nah, we're not going to do this anymore. Just use the website. And actually on the Mac side as well, they're not, they're not, they've, they've stopped supporting the Mac app to do it. They just want you to go through the browser. The downside is you got to have your browser open all the time. Well, but I pretty much have a browser open all the time, right? I mean, so, you know, you kind of think, well, so I've enabled um, notifications on the this monitor and then my work monitor so that no matter which way I'm facing, if if I hear alert an alert come in, it'll, you know, throw it in the corner, a little toast notification pops out. So that from a, from a do nothing, like I did nothing for that. I just signed in and enabled the notifications. Uh, I think for, you know, folks who are just looking for a basic solution, I think that works pretty well. Yeah. You know? the, so. No, the ring cameras, like I said, the ring cameras are great cameras. I just wanted to take it up a little notch. Uh, yeah, no, right on. Stuff. So T Tony also said uh, did it uh, that their neighborhood did a food truck and a cupcake. Wait a minute. There's cupcake trucks? I didn't know that. When did this happen? Like... Pretty oh, soon dude. they're going to be CBD trucks coming around. <laughs> oh, we get they're offering um delivery of you know yeah delivery if you want anything oh, same day sure. delivery. Yeah, what's that you know? app called? There's an app for that. Uh, like a really popular <laughs> one. <I don't> <laughs> <laughs> so, so trying to find a giant banana suit and walk up to somebody's driveway that has blue iris. If they have it, and they, if they have if the, they have the I and they will, they'll pick up a banana for some reason. I don't know. Um, why. Yeah, and this and Alex said we need a beer truck. Like why that hasn't necessarily happened with all the restrictions that came down, especially here in the U.S. for alcohol being delivered. Why somebody didn't you know barbecue and beer trucks together? Oh, yeah. Got it. or we'll just show up at your barbecue with the beer truck <laughs> yeah, there, you <laughs> <go. laughs> there you go god it'd be so great if they just came by and... <laughs> see ya how good would that be um gavin anything else in, in the setup uh we we've gone through a huge chunk of them but anything that i missed that you wanted to talk about in here any other things My, or mike any additional questions you're you 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 guys were getting getting into this in the pre-show any anything else we didn't cover uh during during the course of the show i made a copy of my sighthound vm's drive renamed it so i can fire it back up as a different vm and do it with blue iris now because i want to go back and play with blue iris. so that's what i was <laughs> gavin doing called it this show gavin called it he called just, it I, in the I forget show. how much power there is to blue iris <laughs> and i want to go play so and, i'm gonna and, go play and you gotta remember, Blue Iris does have an iOS app. It has its own iOS app. It has yeah. you know remote access. And one of the things I do utilize heavily is the profiles in Blue Iris. So again, it's integrated with my home um, setup. So when we leave the house, the hub detects nobody's home. It switches the profile on Blue Iris so that certain cameras will start notifying you or turn back on or oh, turn so off. So like you want your indoor cameras to start notifying you now because we're not home, so someone shouldn't be in there, right? Right, and yeah. it's motion or sound, 
right? Okay. And I can tweak yeah. how much sound because my dog likes to bark when we leave. So Same. I have to tweak, uh, turn off certain cameras, but the profiles are very powerful. Well, so the only other thing I'll ask is have they gotten any better? So my most common use case for most of the time, I, I'm not looking at my cameras. Um, I probably open the app two times a day, uh, three times a day, maybe, which I guess is a lot. But my most common use case is I go, I, I, I go to my clips on inside has what they call them. So your restored footage and I want to find, see all the people that day. So I just, it just, there's a filter. It's a show people this date. And then, then here's just all the clips. And it is like so drop dead simple in the iOS app. And I don't see a bunch of garbage. Is it that, is it that simple on the blue Iris app to just be able to say, just show me all the people or just show me all the, you know, trucks or whatever it is. Mm, it kind of shows you all the notifications, but the notifications yeah, that's always that's part that drove me nuts. If you have the AI enabled where it doesn't um, identify people or trucks or stuff, it shows a little icon on those notifications. So you can kind of go through and see the alerts okay. of the people um, and, and the, the regular alerts of just other motion. Yeah. Okay. It's just like the quickest mate way for me to find when did the Amazon guy come? I just go by, I go front door camera people and I'm like, and it's the, it, there's only like three, right? Cause there's only gonna be three times maybe that there were people by the front door. Um, and so it was, it's just been my, my number one go-to. And so I think, you know, this is where I get, I get stuck. Cause I'm like, okay, I, I love the power, but then sometimes I just go back to, I just want the things that I do every day to be easy. Well, there's so many out keeps bringing me back in ways you could do you can get around it so okay so when you have a camera hooked up to blue iris right it, it will be the main camera but you can make copies of that camera right, right. and right. the power comes in that all those copies aren't using any more cpu right they're using the it, it doesn't increase your cpu at all right they're just copies of that same feed right um but you can okay. assign one copy to identify just people and you can assign another copy just to alert on animals and then you can hide the ones you want or create your own little dashboard of people identifying cameras. Oh, you know, yeah. Stuff okay. Stuff like that. So there's so much power, so many things you can do if you, it's just too you much. You want to spend the time. Yeah. yeah. You just want to spend the time. Which I do. I want a project. So I'll end up doing it. All right. I'll report back. <laughs> Bob has an idea to a bourbon and humidor truck. That'd work. Oh, <laughs> that should just be with the beer truck, just to be honest. Yeah. Right. Nara would never see Jim anymore. He's like, She's like, oh, I found a really good way to see all of Omaha. I just follow the bourbon and new humidor <laughs> truck. I just, <laughs> I've, I've seen all of Omaha. <laughs> you know how your kids can sense the ice cream truck coming? Yeah. I'd be like, I think, I think the cigar truck is coming. Um, it's like, it's like Jefferson's and <laughs> wait for it. <laughs> wait for it. It's coming. Um, my neighbor, say I, a brand of a cigar, but I didn't know any. <laughs> uh, it's all right. Um, the other day, my uh, neighbor, my two neighbors were out talking. And so I was like, well, I never see them. You know, I'm going to go and talk with them. So I, I walk out there and one of them smoking a cigar. And I was like, hey, why didn't you come? Hey, we should by? be friends. Why didn't you come by? <laughs> like, wait, could you, did your, is your, is your hand hurt or something? You can't knock on my door, or ring my doorbell. Like, you know, he's like, oh, sorry. I'm like, come on. So he's, he, uh, he immediately got my number and, uh, and, and said, I'll, I'll text you next time. So I said, yes. So I don't need a, I don't need a humor or a truck. we we could just do it in the neighborhood. Um, Gavin, anything else on that? No, uh, it's a good, good it. overview. Yeah. 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 Good overview. You, 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 you gave Mike some homework over the weekend. He'll mm -hmm. go back and forth about four or five times. That's always my thing. goal when I come on this show is either get Mike to spend money or do work. Right. Yeah. And now it's probably gonna be both because now I'm looking at the Foscam doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. should really get another ring yeah. as I'm thinking about this. I'm looking at this sad dashboard that's got three squares and it's just begging for a fourth. I just need to I need to figure out, you know, I I wanted to put one out on the shed, but it's too far away from the Wi-Fi. The changes I made for the um uh when I when I went on the 5G that move farther away, not closer to it. So I don't really want to put anything out there, battery operated Wi-Fi. It's just not going to be a great experience. I'm not going to get anything out there. Then the two sides of the houses, in theory, I could put cameras on those, but uh, why? <laughs> you know, it's one of those kind of things you're like, I don't know if I'm that worried about it or I need it. I mean, I've just got some great, I've got the deck, I've got the driveway, got the front door. 
it covers about 80% of the space that I, I really care about, or I would really want to cover the back deck one covers the shed now. So I can see that from there. Not, not great, but good enough. I, you know, I did some, I redid the shed and kind of, you know, kind of fortified the doors. I'm feeling pretty good about those. So somebody not breaking into that. If, if you know, that's an option. I have one in the garage itself. Oh and yeah. I was, I was going to ask too. you about that. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. And what, why just in case you leave the door open or, well, or my garage uh, one in case you leave the door open you can verify that it's open or closed yeah. too right but yeah. we also have a separate entrance to our garage that you know is not really covered by a camera so if they ever came in through that other entrance this would mm -hmm. pick them up and then as a side use every um fall we seem to get little mice that like to come in there um. right and and try and set up home and usually my dog notifies me because he can smell it <laughs> yeah the upstairs bathroom grill so when he starts scrapping at that i'm like all right set out some mice traps and i get right. like eight for some reason um but the camera will also pick them up running across and so i utilize it for that as well yeah <laughs> and i could use an indoor ring cam those aren't very expensive at all to no. to to do something no. like that, right yeah. I yeah. actually use, you know, I'm actually still using Jim, two of those Cox home life, uh, old cameras that we found. I, you had to go find the URL. You had to have a very specific URL to unlock the UI. Then you need a very other specific URL to like, you need to use URL to yeah. get these yeah. things unlocked. Cause they, they stripped the, the GUI. Um, but I have that in my garage. That's my most used. That's my most, that's the camera I look at the most. Really? Number one, him and I both use it for like, is the other person home? Cause the car is yeah. in the driveway. Yeah. Did I check it every night for, did I close the garage door? Um, we have the kids, so a lot of times they're out there playing in the driveway and we can see them running in and out, uh, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So that, yeah. that's probably my favorite one. And yeah. th that's the other good part is when it's up in the house, it's either getting really good Wi-Fi or for me, that was just a straight shot into the attic. It's right under my right. switch. Right. In the attic. Yeah. And I used to have one of the D-Links was out in the garage and I really like that. And then I moved the Z-Moto out there for a while. The, the Z-Moto had the, you know, it rotate so it could you could get 180 or whatever it was worth of worth of of, uh, of camera coverage. Um, Gavin, do you have inside the house? This is I could never get the the sign off from yeah, the boss yeah. on on inside. Do you have anything in the house and why? I have the inside of the house. It's mainly for security. Um, okay. I had it set up so when we leave the house, it starts recording. Got when it. we're at the house, it's not recording. Not it's just all. me and the wife. Um, but there have been times when she's like, the dog did something funny. She's like, did you catch that on camera? Uh, I'd be like, so you want it recording now? Just this one. So if you ever, <laughs> you know, uh, I wanted to see that video of him grabbing all the snacks off the counter, you know, that right, type of thing. Right. right? So yeah. it's come down to that. So we do have it inside. And again, it's just motion. I also use it as a motion sensor, yeah. sound sensors. So yeah. if gra glass breaks, the camera picks it up. I get notifications about when I'm not home, yeah. that type of stuff. Yeah, we. I don't know if, to be honest, I don't know if we've gone in the last two years a moment where nobody's here. <laughs> you know, yeah. like we just don't leave. We have. I mean, even tonight we went out to dinner, so it does happen, but just doesn't seem to be as often. Yeah, I could. I I put one inside the house one time, and it lasted about a week, and then I was like, Shh, yeah, it's not and, and, and secretly I have one in the base. Not secretly, but I have <laughs> one. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, well, why I have it is secretly, but it's like I have one in the basement, and yeah. uh, the main. I, I'm hoping one day to catch some ghosts or something like that on it. Yeah. Every now and then, I go through notifications. I'm like, did something move down there? You know, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, is something weird happened down there? Because it only starts recording when we go to bed. That one will turn on. Okay. Um, when we're in our night scene, I have that one turn on and monitor yeah. as well. Yeah. Wonder if I could. We you know we use this a lot when we were both going to work and nobody was home was the, the Amazon, Hey, we're gone. We're leaving. And it turns on and listens then for broken glass or some of those uh, fire alarms. Those yeah. kind of things. We do that for bed. We, we say, Madam a good night. And um, yeah. it signals my habitat to execute all the scenes and do everything right. it needs to do. Shut um, everything off. Yeah, uh, go leaving the house and coming home. I have that all automated. So we don't have to do anything. It automatically picks all that up. And that's uh, one little quick tip there. So I do the same thing, Gavin, on, on a lady. I, we have the good night command. So we can say good night um, and she executes all, turning all the lights off. But you can also, in those automations, you can go essentially say, when I say good night, turns off the lights. And then the next thing it does is almost pretend that I told you something else. 
because for simply safe, there's a very specific command of tell simply safe good night. And that tells our simply safe to turn off. Well, I don't want to say that command after I've already said good night. So you just plug in tell simply safe good night. And it acts as if you verbally said that as the next action in those lists. So uh, that's a good one. If you do have something on a lady that needs a verbal command, that's not part of the built-in automations. Uh, simply safe. Isn't one of those where you can just build it into the automation. Uh, you can just essentially it thinks you said it out loud, which is pretty cool. So then so you have one device telling another device what do is that? What no, you're saying? just oh. so like if I tell a lady, I say, right. a lady, tell simply safe good night. That is the command that in, that it invokes the integration or whatever it's called, the skill. It invokes the simply safe skill. And then simply safe responds, uh, uh, would you like me to arm your system in home mode? And I say yes. Okay. Um, so, and you can even set in pauses here so that the yes is built in too. But in when you're building in the A Lady app, you're building out that automation. You can't invoke certain skills. And I can't invoke simply safe. But what you can do is you can say, you can just type in, tell simply safe good night. And it acts as if you verbally said that to her. So when I say Alexa, good night, she turns off all the lights and then, and then she goes, would you like me to arm your system in home mode? And I say, yep. Oops. Oh, it, it, it just heard me say that. I was like, can I hear that to my headphones? It just asked. Um, but yeah, that, that's our kind of home automation. So that little tip okay. trick yeah. with uh, a lady that's automations cool. is just type those in. That's cool. Well, I think we've, I think we've colored, covered, colored, covered the gamut tonight on this. A good, good topic. It always gets me thinking. I think I'm going to set a slick, slick deal alert for uh, a ring, ring. Uh, indoor. That's probably, that's, that's probably the right place to do is put it in the garage and have it uh, in a plug in. I don't need a battery. You know, just one of the plug-in ones. So, so I got both of you to spend money tonight. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, you successful, did. Gavin. Nice work, Gavin. Thanks for thanks for coming back and uh, and sharing this uh, with us. And and thanks for being a listener and all those all those great things as well. It's great to have you on here. Uh, Home Tech FM. If you want to get more Gavin and uh, more of that, is that a more? Do you think you guys are more technical from a show standpoint? Do you get pretty? Do you do you get pretty technical? Um, the show, I'd say the show's still kind of evolving a bit. Um, it's going from talking about the news to now, like stuff happening in the industry to now we're starting to feature a little more stuff. Like recently, um, I added some monitoring to my dryer and I found a really cool device that allows me to integrate it with my home hub, um, wow. that, that using monitoring of the amperage through the power. Um, oh, yeah. I, I won't spoil it. You can go to hometech.fm and find the episode. Yeah, there we go. There there's we go. Little, there's a little teaser for you if you if you want to go out there and uh, and, and get that done. Hometech.fm. Uh, we are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out here at theaverageguy.tv slash live. Christian's on next week, uh, talking about his home theater setup. So that's that's going to be pretty cool. Uh, and then I think Marv B uh, is joining us for kind of a relaunch of his podcast. Uh, he, he got it going, then had to pull it back. Had, his mom had some health problems. He's going to be relaunching it here in the, in the beginning of March. And so we're going to talk about um, that as well as he comes back. And then um, <laughs> uh, Ryan reached out to me from Ryan and Bob from Think Computers. And uh, he was like, okay, uh, tonight's the night. Or it was yesterday. He was like, are we on for it? I was like, no, it's March. And he's like, <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't read. <laughs> so March and February have the exact same dates, right? So so um, the 3rd of uh, the 3rd of March, uh, Ryan and Bob are back. So we appreciate you and we appreciate you for, uh, for listening. We'll do a little bit of a post show if you're hanging around live. And uh, I guess with that, we'll say goodnight, everybody.